Welcome back to Aspire JFN's first annual High Holiday Gathering. My name is Tamar Friedman, and I'm happy to introduce our final panel of today. In this panel, we will learn about the evolutions in the spiritual centers of Jewish life and leadership. How did we get here? What here actually is? And where are we going? I know lots of, lots of big questions. And we are privileged to have this program moderated by Manny Menchel. Manny joined the William Davidson Foundation in 2017 as a program officer for Jewish education. In this capacity, he works to advance and enrich Jewish identity among children, college age and young adults through investments in Jewish day schools and camps, communal experiences and various new and test, time-tested learning models. I, want, I also wanna personally thank Manny for his partnership and thought leadership in putting this panel together, along with Tamar Friedman and Nadine Kochavi of UJA Federation of New York. I wanna thank them both as well for, for their partnership. And with that, I will turn this over to Manny Menchel to frame this session further and introduce the fellow, his fellow panelists. Thank you, Manny. Thank you, Tamar. It's a thrill to join you here for Aspire, the Jewish Funders Network's first annual high holiday gathering, and to welcome with us my esteemed colleagues, Rabbi Elke A. Ramson, president of the Wexner Foundation, Rabbi Sharon Brous, founder and senior rabbi of Ikar, Rabbi Dr. Elliot Cosgrove, Rabbi at the Park in Avenue Synagogue. My name is Menachem Menchel. I'm known as Manny, and I work at the William Davidson Foundation. I want to offer a special thanks to our rabbinic colleagues on this call, because no doubt this week, right before the high holidays, is an incredibly demanding time for each of you. And just as a, a word of disclosure, the William Davidson Foundation, where I work, um, has a professional relationship with the Wexner Foundation, where, where Elka leads, and um, with the Jewish Emergent Network, where, where um, Sharon leads at ICAR. And of course, Elliot, you are a, uh, an alum of the University of Michigan, and I know that you serve on the, um, on the Board of Trustees at the University of Michigan Hillel. So I'm just going to leave it with one, I guess, two words. Go blue. We're going to invite the panelists to turn their videos on. Um, and then I'm going to start with the conversation. The role of the synagogue, the temple, once most prominent in sustaining and advancing Jewish life in America, including spiritual family development, Jewish life cycles, community, Jewish practice, connectedness, has observed a precipitous decline in relevance and influence in the 21st century. As noted by Jack Wertheimer in his book, given the immense philanthropy required to maintain the unwieldy infrastructure of Jewish religious and congregational life, though historically primarily localized, in this moment of far-reaching social and communal disruption, prospectively economic and philanthropic scarcity, it behooves the Jewish funding community to mobilize and to examine the demands of the broader American Jewish community in nourishing its spiritual exploration and development, including rituals, life cycles, and community and connectedness. In our conversation today, we're going to focus on five areas. One, the relationship with the philanthropic community. Two, the pandemic three, innovation, four, the training and development of leaders in this space, and five, the spiritual centers, spiritual centers and politics. We're gonna spend the next 40 to 45 minutes in conversation with our panelists, and then we'll take Q&A for about 15 to 20 minutes. Throughout the conversation, we invite you to post your questions in the chat and those questions will be filtered to me so I can help our panelists access them. Then we'll take a few minutes to wrap up and, uh, and we'll wish you a Shana Tova. With that, we're going to get started. So here we are. Change is happening in America, all around us. Change is happening in American religious life and in Jewish religious life. The Pew Center has demonstrated much research, both Jewishly and broadly, around the change. We know that there are over 2 million individuals with Jewish parentage who's, who no longer identify Jewishly. And there are many individuals who identify Jewishly, but don't identify 
with Jewish religion. They identify culturally and ethnically. So, and, and even the, our, our congregations, well before the pandemic, synagogues were shutting down. They saw a decline in membership. So my question to you, our three panelists, is change needed in the congregational space? Yes or no? And if yes, what kind of change are we talking about? Are we talking about wholesale change or are we talking about small tweaks and adaptations? We're gonna start with you, Rabbi Brous. And don't forget to unmute. All right, welcome. Thank you uh, so much for, for holding this conversation, Manny, and I'm so happy and honored to be with my beloved colleagues and to hear and learn with you all this morning. Is change needed? I mean, change is happening. Change has been needed for decades. And in some way, I think that the pandemic just accelerated our, the rate of realization of this change. It's happened more broadly speaking in terms of American culture and the great awakening to the real changes and transformations that need to be happening in our country. And I think it's also happening on our best days in our Jewish community. Um, hopefully because this period of kind of going inside our homes and, and, and isolating from one another has given us the opportunity to reflect, but also because, uh, because of just the, the raw necessities um, that, that in many ways the shifting patterns of membership in our synagogues and affiliations, um, the, the, financial, um, the, the financial distress that many of our organizations are in right now, all of this has awakened us to the real need to think differently about the future. I will tell you that early on, um, after the stay-at-home orders came here in California, and I know we were about a week behind New York, um, I was speaking with a colleague on the East Coast who said to me, um, who said that in, in an instant, her single greatest asset became her single greatest liability, that they spent tens of millions of dollars in building this massive Jewish institution that now was going to be empty and dormant for, for she said, probably two years. And so what does it mean to rethink the way that we engage community? And in some ways, some people are asking these questions for the first time. Others are saying, this is something that we've been trying to wave the flag about uh, for now over the course of, of the past many years. I will say that what we're seeing right now is a shift from a more transactional Jewish community engagement to a more relational Jewish community engagement. And from, a Jewish, uh, from Jewish involvement, um, that that was per perhaps before more fee for service that now is about shared vision and shared mission. And I will uh, want to mention that I'm reading um, a new book by Vivek Murthy, who's a former Surgeon General of the United States, who talks about three different kinds of relationships that everybody needs to be in. Um, that the first kind is really an intimate relationship, which could be a romantic partner, could be a spouse, or might not be but somebody who really sees you and understands you and gets you. The second is more of a social relationship that these are our group of friends, people who we feel most comfortable with, who we'd wanna celebrate our birthdays with, right? And the third are relationships of shared purpose. In some ways it, it um, maps on Rambam's multiple three levels of, of, um, of a friendship, which I spoke with some folks at JFN about just a couple of days ago. But what's most interesting is that they're both pointing to both the ancient wisdom that comes from Rambam and the contemporary wisdom that comes from Dr. Murthy points to the fact that we as human beings need to be in relationships of shared purpose. We need to be in communities in which we understand that we're all working toward a better community, toward a better society, and toward a better world. And I think that that realization is really hitting the Jewish community hard right now because we're seeing that people are less interested in paying the fees so that they can get the right to go into their synagogue and sit down in, this, in the third pew on the left on High Holy Days, but instead stepping up to support organizations, communities that are pursuing ideas that resonate for them as ancient Jewish ideas that the world desperately needs to live into in this moment. Amen. Thank you, Rabbi Brous. Rabbi Cosgrove, we'll turn to you. Thank you so much, Manny. What an honor it is to be here with you, with JFN, and two of my rabbinic heroes. I'm only sorry I don't have rabbi trading cards to have you sign them right now, um, Rabbi Abramson and Rabbi Brous. Um, so I want to talk about, uh, um, I think it's Rabbi Brous's great uncle. 
and a moment of change, um, who Rabbi Mordechai Kaplan of blessed memory. Um, and what we forget about his book, um, Judaism as a Civilization, is that it was published in 1934 in a context of great spiritual and economic deprivation. Um, and that's significant. The ideas long preceded that moment, but this was a moment where there was a drop in GDP, there were food lines, alcoholism was up, suicide rates rose, there were homegrown anti-Semitisms um, all over the place, and, and, and Kaplan um, reconstructed, uh, had a vision of rebuilding Jewish life. Um, and um, the, again, the ideas preceded that moment, but he looked at that moment as an opportunity for change. And I think that's a model for us today. He took three categories, and some of these build on what Rabbi Brous is saying, of, of believing, belonging, and behaving. And he took the, the belonging model, the old world Stiebel model, and created a JCC movement, Chavurot, um, language of peoplehood that we now take for granted. He took the notion of mitzvot and gave it an anthropological um, contextualization which um, as folkways, a language that has carried American Jewry um, of all denominations over, over the last decades, um, and his notions of belief, um, which uh, he, he took a God, and now's not the time, but naturalized God as a God idea, which I think made it palatable for many American Jews. Um, ours right now is a similar moment of um, of, of economic, spiritual recession and deprivation. And, and, and I think like Kaplan's moment, um, we've known that change has had to happen long before this moment. But what COVID has done is served as a, a disruptor and an accelerator that has forced the toothpaste out of the tube. And so if we look at these three categories, Let's you know start with belonging, right? Rabbi Browse just nailed it. What what does it mean to be part of a community? Um, I'm going to be preaching in a couple of days, and there are going to be more people who are not members of my community than are members of my community tuning in. What? Why are they members? Why are they not members? What can we learn from Spot, Spotify and Netflix and Amazon? Right, we're going through an information revolution right now. There's no reason to believe that we as religious institutions are not any different than other sources of information and community building. Um, but it really goes um, even more deep than that because, um, you know, Kaplan, there were forces internal and external that you were born a Jew, you died a Jew. That's not the case right now. We have porous communities. What does it mean to be part of the Jewish community if we want to be inclusive, but we also, if we're so inclusive, that we have no boundaries, then when do we stop being a community? These are really complicated questions. Um, I could go, let's go through the next categories, mitzvot. Kaplan's I, a notion of mitzvot, of behaving, very strong, but I think it undersells the spiritual strivings of American Jewry today. I think American Jews want to know that their Jewish actions are somehow in accordance with God's will. I think that those Jewish actions are inaccessible to many American Jews. Kaplan's Jews could do it, they just didn't believe it. Our Jews want to believe it, they just can't do it. And so I don't see any reason why in the day of podcast pelotons and, and Instagram live workouts that the Jewish community can't pivot and create synchronous and asynchronous content and rethink how Jewish education works. And then finally, um, uh, God, which, or what we believe. I think people are asking more, not less questions of where God is right now. I think Kaplan's God idea, um, powerful as it was for his time. Um, I think that synagogues have a differentiate, you know, God bless APAC, UJA, ADL, right? They all have their missions. But God, God lives in the synagogue. That's where people struggle with those questions, and synagogues need to proudly and boldly own their differentiated place in the marketplace of Jewish institutional life. And so I think um, 
it's, I, I don't want to go back to Kaplan. I just want to use Kaplan's vision and courage in the Great Depression as a model for us right now to look honestly at the conditions, to not shrike vault, to allow for some, some eggs to be broken, for an omelet to be made, um, and, and to think anew about what the next 90 years of American Jewish life should look like. Thank you. Rabbi Abramson, tell us about the omelets in Ohio. The omelets in Ohio? Just the continuing with the metaphor. How, how oh, do you okay. feel about change? <laughs> I thought I, that wasn't in my papers, Manny. <laughs> um, I, I, I've, um, I just want to thank um, both Sharon and Elliot. And as you're talking, I'm crossing off all the things I can't say because you said it better. Um, as I as I would expect, um, and it's great to be here. I, I'm just going to go back to your original question, Manny, in in which you made a lot of um, chutzpahdic um, assertions about the synagogue, and I just want to give a shout out to the synagogue. I think they're, and we have two rabbis here who are prime examples. There are really great synagogues, and there's hundreds and hundreds of them. And as I'll mention later, I've been to most of them over the course of this pandemic pandemic because I've enjoyed attending shul in remarkable, remarkable places with remarkable rabbis. So I just, you know, there's a lot we don't know, but I, and, I do want to- Pardon me, I know that you also led a congregation for 12 years and you lead High Holidays uh, every year at the 92nd Street Y. I led a congregation for 18, but it felt like 12. Um, and uh, I, um, so I, I want to just say that there are, there are amazing things happening. The question is, how do we share those things? How do we avoid being competitive as congregations and cooperative, which is a tremendous challenge? And I think there's been more of that we've seen come out of the pandemic. I also, um, you asked about change and should we do incremental or big? And the answer is yes and yes. And I think that leadership um, we teach at Wexner is fundamentally about change and Leaders are called upon constantly to manage change. And change is about loss, right? And the losses we felt have just been monumental in this pandemic. And our Jewish leaders have been called upon to manage so much change all at once that it's been overwhelming. Um, echoing what my colleague said, I think that we've all been thrown into a growth mindset to reference Carol Dweck's amazing work, even if we never had one before. And I think that's incredibly beautiful that people are thinking in ways they never thought about. If we were to suggest some of the things that are happening for, for the Hagim this year, a year ago, it would, have, it would have been dismissed before it even reached you know, the boardroom. It would have been dismissed out of hand. And I find that what's being considered now is remarkable. Um, I'll just make a, a larger comment that um, Elliot mentioned uh, about boundaries. You know, I have the privilege of working with emerging Jewish professionals and the issue of boundaries is huge for them. And they've been sort of telling us for a long time that boundaries are a false construct and you have to knock down the walls. And I think we're all now in that space of what does it mean, you know, to be a congregation without walls. Uh, I also want to say a word about um, change itself. Um, two years ago, I did a an experiment asking rabbis of different generations what their classes in their seminaries were shrine gavalt about when they were rabbinic students. And I know that for my classmates, it was about um, getting rid of bimas. That was like the thing, like flatten the shul, no stairs, no high place. And a lot of us did that. And even if there were shuls with stairs, and that's still the case, you'd find us on the floor, right? Even though the stairs were behind us. So. I asked a most recent set of graduates, what's your issue? And the answer was stairs, bimas, we don't want synagogues. You know, so they, now those same people are all working in synagogues, right? Cause that's where they can express their rabbinate. So we, we have to sort of find ways to do both and huge changes, small changes, synagogues and small communities, emerging communities and legacy communities, margins and mainstreams, the opportunity now that the pandemic has allowed us to see is how do we merge those and vary those? Thank you. Thank you, Elka. We're, we might return back to some of those points in a, in a bit. 
Um, right now, I want to turn us to uh, the philanthropic community and those conditions for change. Private philanthropists, foundations continue to see increased influence in the policies and the practices of Jewish life in America. We have in front of us a critical representation of philanthropists and Jewish foundation professionals. I'm going to read a quote on the altered philanthropic environment from Jack Wertheimer's Avichai sponsored report, Giving Jewish, How Big Funders Have Transformed American Jewish Philanthropy from March 2018. It was not long ago that big funders in America, in American, of American Jewish life, generally conducted their philanthropic giving according to a fairly standard script. He continues, they treated their synagogue or synagogues and then the broader local Jewish community as their primary philanthropic responsibility, as was giving to Israel. So I ask you, and Elka, we'll start with you. What does the funding community need to know and think about in terms of the future of Jewish spiritual centers and congregational life? And further, what, what is the future sustainability of congregations? Is this a time for us, and you use this word, for us to be thinking about mergers and, and consolidations? Well, I think that, I think the question, um, the short answer is diversify, which is what we've done at Wexner. And when the foundation was established 35 years ago, what our funder said was, and still says, if I knew the answer to where success will live in the Jewish community, I'd put all my money there. But I don't know. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to diversify as much as possible. Now, diversifying has become more and more complicated. When I started at the foundation 20 years ago, there were fundamentally four rabbinic schools. So we, we invested in four, you know, four kinds of rabbis. Today, we're probably diversifying in more than double that kind of rabbi, including rabbis we never would have considered 15 years ago. So even what it means to be a Jewish professional has dramatically changed. Our, our, our field fellowship, which we developed three years ago, funds and supports Jewish leaders who didn't go to graduate training in Jewish professional life, right? You can, I mean, you can leave Hillel and be grabbed as a Jewish professional because someone at that Hillel thinks you're a worthy candidate. So we really have to invest in all kinds of people. And I think we have to sort of break open what it means to be a congregation in that growth mindset spirit in, in the spirit of Kaplan, what does it mean to be a Kahal these days, right? It may not look like our grandparents, our parents. It, it's going to look different. It could be a circle of people much smaller. And those large, open, empty buildings have to find a way to include without controlling those circles of meaning that young people are, are running to. And I think that's really hard. Uh, in terms of, I, I want to answer the merger question. Um, I've now uh, been, consult been consulting on a few mergers of organizations. And I, I'm going to go to one place on this, even though I have a lot to say about it, which is the Jewish community has to invest in trained Jewish organizational merger consultants. Because we're relying on business consultants, we're relying on, you know, consultants who do mergers and acquisitions way outside the Jewish community, and it is not the same skill set. It's not valued the same way. And on that issue, um, I also want to say that we have to allow our volunteer leaders and our professional leaders to experiment and to play without, uh, to play it with ideas without feeling like they're going to be banished for even bringing it up. Because you say the word merger, you say the word collaborate with another shul, and immediately there's a competitive spirit. And I've just watched I've just watched beautiful opportunities um, crumble under the weight of technical and not adaptive challenges. What are we gonna name the building? Where are people gonna park if we go to that building? You know, uh, my grandfather got married in this building. All of those things are jumped to the front and we lose the, the dreaming conversations, the Jewish values conversations because there are not trained facilitators. So I can't say enough about investing in individuals for the next few years who will be able to help hold those conversation and not place on the shoulders of the rabbis and congregational presidents alone. Thank you. Elliot, we'll turn to you. And I, I wanna invite um, each of you to 
to jump in if you have comments for each other. But Elliot, um, Elka, Elka mentioned something about the large buildings. Um, in Manhattan, there are lots of large buildings right now in the pandemic. They happen to be uh, probably pretty empty. But what, what could that look like um, for large urban densely populated areas, those kinds of sharing of spaces or mergers or not necessarily mergers, but collaborations? Um, I'll ask you that and then invite you to comment on, on what, the, what the philanthropic community might, might learn from this. Yeah, thank you. Um, look, I believe that as long as we're human beings, we're going to want uh, to be with other human beings. Uh, and so uh, I'm, I don't think the argument for community is going anywhere. I think it's changing. But uh, I, you know, and I might look back on this, you know, Zoom video conference and say, Elliot, you were fooling yourself uh, years from now. But I think people are thirsty for community. I think people want to sit in pews with each other. I think that uh, the human need for social contact, I think we're all feeling it's, it's lacking. And I think we all need it to come back. I think there will be changes uh, in, in you know, how adult education classes, and there will be people who will take it online, and there's all sorts of opportunities we can talk about, but I think the magic of sitting in a room together um, and, and schmoozing with people at a kiddish and, and raising your children in community and celebrating smachot, I, I don't think that's going anywhere. Um, could be wrong, I don't think. I'm just I'm chiming wrong. in to agree. Um, <laughs> by all means. So, um, look, um, to the, the first question of, uh, of funding and, and what, what Elka answered. So first of all, let me say something obnoxious. Um, I have no idea who's on this call, but why did Kaplan write that book? Kaplan wrote that book because a bunch of well-funded um, people got together um, and created a prize. And um, Julius Rosenwald, um, as explained in Chasia Diner's new book, um, ponied up the money for a national essay contest. 62 people had visions of reconstructing American Jewish life. We just know Kaplan's because Kaplan won. So create a crowdsourcing opportunity, you people on this phone call, and let's reimagine Jewish life. Um, as far as where to spread our bets, um, I want to encourage everyone to take a look at an Eli talk by one of the finest Jewish educators I know, um, my wife, Debbie Cosgrove. And Debbie um, talked about the four children at the Seder table. And she talked about the wise, wicked, simple, and one who doesn't know how to ask as a way to think about your funding portfolio. The wise are the, are the, are the bets that we all know, the UJAs, the Jewish day schools, um, the Hillel's on campus. The wicked, those are our contrarian bets. Those are the ones, the people that have written out of the Jewish community, but we do it. We do honeymoon um, in Israel. We do the people on the, on the edges because, because we're not just about Jewish day schools. Um, and then there, the, and I could go through all her various categories, but she says it um, better than I do, but the one who doesn't even know how to ask, um, those are, you know, those are the, the let's have the conversations. Um, and funders can also do that, of bring people around the table and let Jewish professionals ideate um, and, and hopefully operationalize ideas. So there are different ways to structure it. And, and the final thing on your last uh, question, Manny, about um, consolidation and institutions. Um, look, I think, um, yeah, uh, there is no reason why, I, I'm out here on the Upper East Side, um, that some, you know, that a funding arm of the Jewish world can't incentivize a way to, um, to have collaboration between institutions. Me and the eight synagogues in our um, radius all don't need to invite um, the same speaker um, into our community, right? I know um, there, there are models of this going on. Um, so I think that's number one. I think that there can be ways that um, uh, people can be less concerned about boundaries um, and more concerned about service. Um, I also think that there are real questions about um, having the maintaining the value proposition of, uh, of a synagogue. So, so if I'm in Los Angeles and I know I can be live 
listening to Rabbi Brous, or for that matter, if I'm in New York and I can hear Rabbi Brous inspire me, um, why would I, you know, connect to um, my my local synagogue um, close as I am, but doesn't have um, th uh, all the gifts that Rabbi Brous or Rabbi Abramson does? Um, how do the WalMarts not put out the local businesses? I think those are those are real questions. Um, that also need to be, um, you know, named and put in the front. Yeah, thank you. And, and I think one of the questions is, who says they shouldn't? Um, but, but on that note, I will actually take the moment, uh, Sharon, as we turn to you, to actually express my hakarat hatov, my personal gratitude to Sharon, because from Detroit and from New York, I spent my summer um, dialed in, zoomed in, to Ikar every weekend. Um, Have you joined Ikar? Um, I've I've made I've made contributions. Specifically. Keep making contributions. Absolutely, and and we all should. Um, and and I've joined because they've Ikar and Rabbi Brous and and her colleagues have have nourished what I've been looking for in a very isolating time. So so thank you, Sharon. Um, Sharon, what, what can we learn? Can what I just jump in before we go to Sharon? Because I think Elliot's question, had you joined Icar, is a little bit combative for younger people who are looking for, and man, I don't know if you're one of those people, like you have a different sensibility, but I think if that's the, if that's the first question we ask, I think we're missing an opportunity to say, that's great. And, and I don't, Icar is not the issue, is where are they connecting? So Sharon, I'll let you go, but I just wanted to, well, a little. Sharon, do you have something to say about that, about the way that people are contributing or becoming members to Ikar from afar? Yeah, first, I'm still reeling that uh, that Rabbi Kosgrove called us the Walmart of the Jewish community. <laughs> so I don't know exactly how to take that. Um, but I, maybe the Trader Joe's, Whole Foods, I mean, there are other, you know, okay. Um, so yeah, it, it, first of all, I, Manny, I'm th so I'm so touched and thrilled and moved that you found comfort in connecting with our community from Detroit during this time. And this is absolutely one of the silver linings of the pandemic. We start we started doing like everybody, um, you know, daily minion online, lunch and learns online, evening learnings online, and immediately we had people with us from Brazil and from Tel Aviv and from small towns in Spain and lots of people from New York and Chicago and Philly. And we were just astonished. And they, they were, I mean, joining, our, joining our, our learning when it was the middle of the night where they were. Um, and what really surprised me, and Manny, we've spoken a little bit about this, but um, it surprised me that many of them have actually joined the community, that they can get everything for free, right? They don't have to be a member to come to Shabbat services, to come to High Holy Days, which is free and open to everybody. And of course we're broadcasting on the website, but as ambivalent as I am about Facebook, we're also putting it on Facebook Live just because we want anybody who might, any Jew who happens to go online that day to be able to say like, oh, that maybe, maybe I'll come to Rosh Hashanah for an hour. So they could get it all for free. So why are people joining when they don't actually have to, especially when I've been talking for 17 years about how my generation and younger doesn't join. We're not joiners. Like we have this allergy to institutional engagement and, um, and we want to be able to be more particular um, we, we, in our affiliations. Um, and yet what we're seeing is kind of a counter testimony to that. And I think Part of the reason why is because as Elliot spoke so beautifully about earlier, and I can't wait to hear the whole sermon, Elliot, um, people want to belong to something. We want to be part of a tribe. And I think we're seeing this playing out nationally in some of the most grotesque and dangerous ways. And we're seeing it play out communally in some of the most beautiful and inspiring ways. People want to be part of something. And so, and they want to be seen and known somewhere. So even though we're not going to see and know each other in person, I'm going to see that person from Brazil week after week after week. I'm going to greet him. I'm going to welcome him. My new member from St. Louis, who's been, you know, every time he would come to LA in the past, he would come in, in on Shabbat morning. I remember, you know, we've met many times, but now he's with us on the Zoom every Shabbos and he's part of our life now and I'm part of his life. And I think 
People want to feel like they are connected to the people who stand on the same side of history as they do. Because we're not only experiencing pandemic right now, we're experiencing multiple compounding layers of crisis that are leaving us all feeling absolutely desperate, fearful for the future. Our whole world feels like it's turned over and we know that the worst is yet to come. We know what the next two months are gonna be like and we know what the two months after that are gonna be like. And we can only imagine what comes after that. So what do you do when the, when the world is shaking? I live in Los Angeles. Like when you feel those tremors under your feet, you find your people. And I think that people need to find each other. And you see how people, they start on the Facebook Live and then they start coming into the Zoom because they actually want not just to see me, but for me to see them, right? And so, so for our members now who've joined from, a, we created this membership category. I think a lot of, a lot of communities did this, Ikar from afar. So for the people who've done that, I'm not gonna be officiating their baby namings and their funerals, right? We may actually never meet face to face. I hope we will, but they're not joining because of a service that I'm gonna provide them. They're joining because they want to be in relationship with, uh, with other people who are standing in the same moment of history that they're in, asking the same questions that they're asking and trying desperately to figure out what does it mean to be a Jew and a human being in what literally when the world is on fire. So I feel that's the kind of the critical question of this moment. How do we find our way to our people and, and lift up together a collective voice where we can see each other and be seen by each other so that we can affirm that, 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 it actually, that our existence fundamentally matters in this moment. Sharon, can I ask you why you wouldn't officiate at their funerals or their baby namings? Because they mean, live if, in Brazil, right? I mean, no, but, you, but if, if, the, if, the, if you, you posited that there's real like beautiful human connection. Yeah. I'm just wondering where it goes to Elliot's question of boundaries. Like where does that end? And I, I'm, I'm, I'm like open to you saying, yeah, I would do it. I'm just wondering what, why is that the, the end of that? Space? Oh, it's, but it's not because that's not part of the membership package. It's because they literally don't live anywhere that I could get to and they know it. No, but right? I, I'm asking you, I, I guess I'm pushing you to say if they have their baby on their zoom and you're like right here, like you oh, are. For sure. For sure, I would do that. Yeah, yeah and by the way, okay. the thing that, okay. that, yeah. that I'm also concerned about, and, and I realize my question was provocative, is what happens to the, the small suburban synagogue in Manny's neighborhood? Right? That's what I mean. Be, me, meaning, if, if and, and let's depersonalize it because it's I'm not trying to. Out <laughs> That's okay. We 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 anymore. have we have folks but, in the audience who have asked. But I, I I I'm meaning what what are the implications if someone's tuning in to my chazan or to, to Rabbi Brous or at the 92nd Street Y, what what for for um the small the synagogue back to how I began that was already struggling before COVID that was already facing issues of consolidation and now they know they can tune in. Um, and have Rabbi Brous not only listen to her, but have her do the baby naming possibly by Zoom. So what's gonna happen to my small community in Farmington Hills? Yeah. Um, I, I think the, the, I, I, we gotta talk about this. And I think that the really interesting things that are going on in the community, I only, well, one example is our colleague, um, Rabbi Sherry Hirsch, at uh, American Jewish University in, in Los Angeles is trying to figure out a way that, you know, sort of, okay, so she'll hire Doris Kearns Goodwin um, and, and do that thing, but Rabbi Brous and me and 10 other synagogues can have sort of a mm -hmm. subscription sort of thing because we all don't need to hire Doris Kearns Goodwin to give our post-election lecture. Um, I think those are interesting models to, um, to the, the affirm the local community, but also um, uh, provide resources. I, I wanna move us on. I, 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 think we need to, I think we need to attend to that question. And I think that there's uh, place. I have, Elka, absolutely, go one ahead. One more point. But my other sure. point is that there's a big difference between the population centers of Jewish life between Los Angeles and New York, where there's this mass numbers of Jews, mm -hmm. and, and the Midwest, where it's just a very different reality, um, where mergers and cooperation are really on our shoulders in a very different way. And increasingly, Jews are moving to those population centers. And that's just going to be another huge challenge, as well as suburban and urban. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. We, we need to spend more time on this. We do. And it might not be the same conversation. 
in the, in the coasts as it is in the Midwest, et cetera, um, and in Spain. Um, Danny, can I, can, I, I know you want to move on. No, 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 you absolutely can. I just want to lift up something that Elliot said earlier that I think is really critical here. And, and he, and I think we all agree on this. The minion is one of the oldest technologies in human civilization. People fundamentally need to be together. They need to say and have someone else say amen. And I think as soon as we are allowed to be together again, we're going to find our way back together. I'm not worried that we're good, that, you know, people are going to only want to have, you know, shoals with no walls and only virtual and only Elliot's sermons and, and someone else's great chazan nude. We're going to want to be together. And I think the small, small suburban synagogue still ha holds a place in the world because, because we are a con fundamentally conveners of human beings who need human contact. And I think at the same time that people will continue to hopefully take inspiration from a broader sense of connectedness to Klal Yisrael, to communities that they can only see through the screen. And so maybe we're going to be operating on multiple fronts now in, in, in a more exaggerated or amplified way than we were before. Great. I, we've talked about aspirations and perhaps some conceptions of what the future might look like. Um, let's talk about celebrations for a moment. This summer, it's been crazy. I'm sure it's been crazy for each of you. Would you share with us, um, each of you, something that you just drew inspiration from, a highlight, something that you celebrated this summer uh, within the realm of your congregation or the community that you lead. Um, we'll start with you, Sharon. The most inspiring thing that I've seen come out of this time is an incredible creativity that's being born. Um, I think Elka hint, spoke to this a little bit earlier, this kind of adaptive mindset, growth mindset that we're moving into now. But we are in, I mean, in some way, there's so much loss here. Let me first just acknowledge that there's so much loss. I mean, I've sat with families who have to count the 10 people who are allowed to go to the graveside and which grandchild doesn't get to go. And I mean, it's excruciating. This whole, this whole thing is so unnatural and so painful. And in some ways, the limitations, the tight containers that these little boxes that we all live in now have put on our lives, have opened up incredibly beautiful creativity in ways that we just have, could not have even envisioned before. Um, I got my beautiful box from Park Avenue Synagogue last week. Um, and just as I was opening it up, I actually was in my, uh, in my office where we had all of our boxes that we were sending, our baskets that we were sending around us. And we were just marveling at the incredible beauty and the thoughtfulness and the richness that synagogues around the country now, this year have put into curating beauty that we could, so we could put beauty into people's homes so that we can say like, we care about you and here's something beautiful that you can hold that will remind you of the, of how profoundly interconnected we all are. So it's not one incident I want to draw, I want to draw our attention to. It's more the whole, there's a whole range of, of things that are happening now in our community and in communities around the country that simply could not or would not have happened before. Um, the collaborations around uh, that, that, that in, in the Jewish Emergent Network, and I don't know if you want to talk about this later, I'm happy to speak more to this, but ways that we're going to be like, we are bringing content and richness and music to, to communities all around the country that we never would have been able to share before. We're doing a shofar wave in Los Angeles starting at 3 p.m. on day two of Rosh Hashanah when, when all the way out in Pasadena, someone's gonna start blowing shofar and then someone else and then someone else and then someone else and we're waving all the way to the ocean. And so people all the way through, across, I mean, we're literally tens of thousands of people will take to the street in a social, safe and socially distanced way so that we could hear shofar. You have Orthodox communities and secular you know, unaffiliated communities and, and, and conservative and all coming together to blow shofar, like things that we just absolutely could not have ever envisioned before. So in some ways, it's bringing out the, bad, the better angels in us yeah. um, because we're forced to be more creative because we're so limited in what we're actually able to do. And, and I will just, just to, to actually answer your question, just say one last thing. For me, one of the most touching elements of this new kind of virtual reality is that every time we have a communal gathering, people don't want to hang up at the end of it. And so like there's this sweetness 
that, I mean, after the Facebook live feed is over and then you just have the people who are on the Zoom, people stay and they want to connect so deeply. And you see the hunger that we have for each other in a way that just absolutely lifts my spirits, despite the smoke and the hurricanes and the pandemic and the crisis to democracy and every, we need each other. And, and, and that, I feel like there's a, a kind of a, a, such a deep and, and profound love that we're able to lift up in this moment. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Uh, we're going to move to you, uh, Elka. And um, I'm just going to take a moment to remind folks that you can post questions. We're, we've got about 15, 10, 10 to 15 minutes left in this part, and then we'll be moving to Q&A from the crowd. So get your questions in. Uh, Elka, a, a highlight. Yeah, I'm just going to go personal. Um, Sharon captured a lot of some of the uh, more communal events that I've experienced as well. Uh, my mom turned 91, uh, and she's an incredibly um, amazing, driving, lives alone woman. And we got her friends on Zoom for a birthday. Mm -hmm. And um, it worked and didn't work. It didn't work because there's everyone's was like, you know, this onto the screen. They're all talking at once. And I found myself saying, you know, mute yourselves now. Okay, there's a mute button. And then I just sort of uncharacteristically let go and just sat back. Mm -hmm. And it was this crazy, noisy, beautiful group of her family and her friends who have never done Zoom, like just yelling at each other. And it was, it would never have happened beyond the pandemic. We never would have thought to suggest that 90 year old, if you want to live to be an um, old lady, move to St. Paul, Minnesota, because she's got so many friends who are alive, thank God. And it was one of the holiest things I've seen in the beautiful, pandemic. Beautiful, thank you and happy birthday. <laughs> amen, amen. Elliot. Look, I, I think um, Sharon said it best. Um, well, you know, I, I think of a comment that uh, Heschel made that um, all our task is to create life as if it's a work of art. Um, and right now, the canvas ain't so big. None of us are Jackson Pollock flinging paint hither and yonder. We all have to find and create beauty um, on a much smaller scale. Um, but, you know, it happens. So it happens with um, B'nai Mitzvah, eat week in and week out, that we're blessing from afar. It happens um, with um, baby namings and brisses um, that, you know, wonder of wonders, it is possible to welcome a child into the covenant of the Jewish people without platters and pounds of Nova locks. Um, it is, uh, you know, a, a wedding that was supposed to be a gala affair um, that was canceled or delayed. And then I got a phone call saying, look, we love each other. We want to get our life going. We want our parents next to each other at the chuppah. Can you marry us? And it was beautiful. So yeah. stories, I got a lot of stories. Great. Thank you. Thank you, each of you, for indulging us. Um, moving to a more complicated question. Long-standing debate around particularism and universalism within philanthropy. Does the pandemic change the calculus when there are people who have major, major financial constraints? Do, do you think that the philanthropic community should be looking at world hunger versus Jewish education through a different lens right now? or social justice, what the, 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 the challenges of today, do they demand something different? We'll stick with you, Elliot. If I'm gonna rewrite uh, Kaplan's behavioral rules, I would say there needs to be mitzvot that are both inward looking and mitzvot that are outward looking, right? What did, what did Dr. King teach? That we're all tied into a single garment of destiny. And so I think the Jewish community needs to elevate and make sacred both kinds of mitzvot. Uh, and I think uh, that's very important. Um, you know, how people decide to spend their, their time and how, their and how they spend their money. Um, well, I, I'm unapologetically, I think people should give first to Jewish institutions. I think because, because non-Jews aren't. Um, it's just a game of math for me. Um, and I have plenty of texts to back that up. Uh, but 
um, it brings great, it redounds to the great credit of the Jewish people when I see someone in the ACLU, um, in, in some other NGO, um, uh, as a Jew working to um, bring justice to this world. Um, I don't, I don't, that, that's actually a credit to us as a people. Um, but I think you, you got to have people serving humanity as Jews. Thank you. Sharon? Well, I, I of course do not think this is an, e an either or. Um, I think very often about that great story um, that I think is Rabbi Yitz Greenberg who shared that I'm sure many of you know that he walked into a room with a mega donor in the Jewish community, maybe one of the 52 people on this call who I can't see, <laughs> um, and went with a, with a big ask for a new Jewish school that he was planning on building. And the donor said to him, I'm going to stop you in your tracks. Don't waste your time, Rabbi. I give to hospitals. I give to art. I give to emergency crisis relief. I do not give to Jewish schools. And so the rabbi turned to walk out of the room and then before he left said, but you forgot to ask me one thing. What am I going to be teaching in this Jewish school? And the donor said, so tell me what you're going to be teaching. And he said, I am going to be teaching young Jews that they need to grow up to be the kind of people who give to hospitals, who give to art, who give to emergency crisis relief. And so I very much see this conversation as one conversation. We are Jews. We are also Americans. We are also human beings. There are many layers of, uh, of connective tissue that connect us both to our narrowest community and to our broadest. And it's absolutely our obligation and our responsibility to be feeding our, uh, our sense of what it means to be human in our Jewish institutions. And so we teach and we preach in our Jewish spaces about what our obligations are to the, to the broader community. And therefore it's mutually reinforcing. And so most of our funders can actually and thankfully fund both. I believe that, uh, that, that giving is a muscle, that when you work that muscle, you realize that you're actually good at giving and that you can give more. Um, and very rarely do we, have, uh, do we have situations where people say, I only have this very limited amount to give and I have to decide between feeding a hungry person or supporting my shul. But instead, when we get into the habit of giving, we understand that giving begets more giving and, and goodness grows from that. Um, so I think it's, it's not an either or, it's, it's absolutely a both and. To be better universalists, we should be better particularists. The more deeply we invest in our own Jewish learning, our own Jewish lives, the more committed we'll be to working toward saving humanity. Right. Beautiful. Thank you. Elka. Yeah, I, I, I agree completely that it's, we can't make it um, a choice. It has to be both and. And I just want to say a bit about um, emerging Jewish professionals that we work with. And that's my limited view. Um, full disclosure, I have uh, four children. Two of them are rabbis. One is uh, an Orthodox rabbi and one is in her fifth year at JTS. So she's almost a rabbi. So I have a lot of rabbis claiming in my head who are um, under 35 um, and all of our fellows. And I think there's a certain um, trauma-informed leadership of our young people. And I, I, I think when we separate the universal from the particular, we do so at our own peril to those we want to attract to Jewish leadership. They are, um, they're, they're frightened about the future for all the reasons that have been identified from climate change to the, you know, the fear of a crumbling democracy. Uh, their, their passion for d diversity and for racial justice is, it, it, for many of them is um, their leading cause. And they see it as a uniquely Jewish cause. And we have to hear that cry and we have to, um, Look, either we walk in step with them or, you know, we lose them. And I, um, I'm not sure I would have said this without the, the fellows ringing in my ear. Mm. Um, they, they care deeply about these things. And it is, they don't separate it from their Jewish soul. It's, it's part, thank God, like it's a part of their Jewish soul because they've heard from great rabbis like um, Sherry and Elliot what it means to be a human being and to be a Jewish human being uniquely. And I think we have to give that a lot of careful thought. And even if somehow we think there are two separate categories of giving, we've got to find ways to talk about Jewish philanthropy and Jewish giving and Jewish causes as part of the um, sort of the human future together. It really matters. 
Thank you. Thank you. This is going to be our, our final question that I pose, and then we're going to turn to our uh, illustrious audience here. Um, Elka, we're going to stick with you. You just spoke about your children who are rabbis. They were members, uh, or they are members in, of uh, the Wexner Fellowship. So Shai held in the preceding session, he shared that what we all know, which is that the strength of today's spiritual communities is dependent on the capacities of its leaders. Um, Elka, the Wexner Foundation under your leadership has been responsible for training an incredible number, you know, training and developing of the Jewish community's great leaders and influential rabbis. So we're gonna invite you to allow us to peek under the hood a little bit. What would you like to see more of in rabbinical schools in training today's spiritual leaders and to be prepared for, uh, for what, they have to, uh, what they have ahead of them? Yes, I have a lot to say about that, but I wanna respect the time boundary um, and spend a great deal of my time thinking about the answer to that question. So I'm going to choose highlights and I'm happy to talk to anyone about this um, for a long time. If, if I were to give one piece of advice to rabbinic schools, and I think I have given this piece of advice to rabbinic schools, it's to focus on mentorship, serious, deep, thoughtful mentorship that doesn't start and stop in the boundary of those five years, but takes them on a journey for a lifetime. I just don't think we do a good enough job at that. We, t we use the word mentor, we throw it around, but what does it mean to really match a rabbinic student with a suitable mentor? And it doesn't mean we let students run out there and say, you know who I love? I love Elliot or I love Sharon because they're all gonna do that. And Sharon and Elliot only have so much time and there are great rabbis everywhere. And if we really took the time, and I would even say every school should have someone whose job it is solely to supervise the mentorship of students, not to be the mentor, to go out and find that person and figure out when mentorship changes over the course of a lifetime. There's literature on mentorship. It is not an informal activity. It's a, it's a essential educational process. Look, how did ordination happen in our ancient days, right? We laid hands on individuals, right? It was a mentored relationship. And that's been lost, I think, in the graduate school sort of um, structure of most of our schools. I think it's happening more and more, but I think our schools need to take it very, very seriously. And I'll just um, put in a good word for, I think um, schools need to do a better job at uh, giving student, giving their rabbinic students Musar training and really working on values mm -hmm. and character building as an as a essential skill to becoming a rabbi and for becoming a good rabbi to your congregants. Thank you. Elliot, what do our, what do our rabbinic schools need to I think I, I'm, I'm actually thinking very deeply about your question. I'm aware, well aware of um, the, the blessings of my rabbinate. Um, and I have, um, and if there's one thing that this moment has, like the, the, the headline of this is, they didn't teach me this in rabbinical school. So, um, you know, could so. They have, could what? they have? Could they have taught you this? I don't think so. I look back on rabbinical school and there's, you know, Elka, I'm not part of these conversations. I, I don't know what curriculum is or isn't, but um, I uh, think that um, JTS is the institution that, and uh, maybe this gets into your mentorship comment, they gave me the label of being a rabbi, but you know, when I think about what it means to be a rabbi as a pastor to a community, as um, the leader of a not insignificant not-for-profit and, and, a, and a, a preacher and teacher of our tradition. Um, you know, those, you know th those hours that I spent just studying Talmud and texts and otherwise, um, I wouldn't change it for the world. I wouldn't change it for the world. Um, and so I, I think um, maybe Elka, and, and you've devoted your career to this question, maybe it's, it's jealously protecting the gifts, the, 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 the teaching that differentiates a rabbi from a social worker or other communal professional, right? You need to be embedded in tradition, but creating those mentorship, professional, this worldly opportunities that 
gives you the instincts to walk into a shiva house and know who the bereaved is, to um, run a capital campaign, or to figure out how to transform your community online in the face of a pandemic. Because that they're not going to teach you in rabbinical school. Yeah. Thank you, Sharon. Well, amen and amen to what both of my colleagues just shared. Um, I think that one of the great challenges of the rabbinate right now and probably always has been figuring out how to apply this ancient wisdom to a very fluid and often very volatile contemporary reality. And that also is a muscle. Like philanthropy is a muscle, I was saying earlier, um, you know, we just cannot be having the same conversations and we can't be sharing the same sermons, the same Torah that we would have shared five years ago or even seven months ago in a really different set of circumstances. And I feel that that we are not, we I was not trained, we are not uh, trained, and it might be very different now because I was ordained in 2001, to have that kind of access, to draw from our tradition what the hour demands of us. And there's a text from the Slonimer that I'm always teaching and, and, and thinking of, and I, I wake up with it every single morning in which he essentially says that, that the remnant that survived the Holocaust is called to ask every single day, who am I called to be in this moment? Who is my generation called to be? We survived for a reason. And he said, God didn't let us survive so that we could count our cattle, right? So that we could, so that we could get rich in this moment. God let us survive. And I mean, you might not agree with his theology, but so that we could understand who are, what, what am I uniquely able to contribute to the world? And what does this moment that I'm living in demand of me? And, and so I wonder with, with the Torah that I have, what, can, what does this moment demand of me, of us? And are we adept enough in, in answering that question? Or is our job just to, you know, just to take the Torah as it was and share it with the people and hope that they find a way to make meaning out of it? I, I, I don't want to, I, I mean, I don't want to be alarmist in this moment, but I really believe that so much of what has made life for, for us in America safe and holy and liberating it is is we're at the cusp of that disappearing right now i mean we have seen such a such a stark erosion of the very democratic norms that have made this country a safe refuge for jews like my great grandparents and many of your parents great grandparents maybe you yourselves who fled oppression pogroms all kinds of persecution are we seeing the disappearance of those very elements in this country in this moment? And what Torah, what wisdom have I learned that I, can, that I can share with my people to help us understand how to see the signs of what's actually happening before us right now and how to lead from a place of, of ancient wisdom, how to find comfort, how to find, spirit, how to find spiritual strength when we are at risk of seeing everything that we have be lost. And so, I, I mean, I feel that's the critical question we have to be asking right now. And how do you teach that in rabbinical school? It's not just teaching text, but it's teaching how we apply text to life in a way with a kind of ferocity that I was not taught, frankly. And, and maybe that's happening now. I hope it is. But I, I want for us to be, work, we have to be working out through seminary, through our five, six years in rabbinical school so that we know and understand that we're called to translate those texts into the moment in, in a way that we can help give people a sustenance when they desperately need it. Yeah, thank you. And oh, one oh, quick we, thing. We have, yes, one quick thing. We oh, have okay. less than 10 minutes. So we need to honor that, but Elka, go for your one quick thing. Stop me at 30 seconds, because I think um, in, in Sharon's passion, she, re she reminds me of another important piece of training, which is we've got to get young rabbis in rooms with rabbis who look, sound, nothing like them, whose mm -hmm. Torah is different, and let them bump up against other people, which schools 
don't do a good job of. I love the schools, but it's what Wexner really shines at. And it changes you right. when you're confronting someone's Torah that looks different and you have to defend it. Great. Th thank you. Thank you. I I'm going to move on. I have a question that actually relates to your points about mentorship. But just before we do, one word, one word only. What advice do you have for a young rabbi in the moment of a pandemic? One word. Uh, Elliot, one word. Hope. Hope. Thank you. Elka? Generous listening. Hyphenated word. <laughs> Thank you. Sharon? Love. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all. Uh, so much here, so much beauty, and so much rich content that we need to reflect on. Um, a question that came in that really relates to your, your comments about mentorship, and Sharon, I'm directing this question to you. The Jewish Emergent Network, which was established with a lot of generous funding from this funding community, uh, was designed to support mentorship. The rabbinic, uh, sorry, the rabbinic fellowship specifically, was designed to support mentorship. Um, was that a successful initiative? What have you learned from it, both in its successes and its failings? Tell me how many seconds I have to answer. I don't want to overstep. Yeah, let's, let's try to stick with 120 <laughs> seconds, two minutes. <laughs> okay. Three We've learned, minutes. first of all, I have immense gratitude for the funding community because they really, you really took a chance on this. Uh, when we brought five years ago the idea to the funding community to have uh, a network of seven communities where we, would, uh, where we would build a rabbinic fellowship. The idea was that we would each hire seven uh, newly ordained rabbis who would, go, who would immerse in each of seven communities across the country, and then every six weeks or so would travel from one community to the other for intensive, immersive experiences. Um, where they would build a kind of cohort and they would also be able to learn from all different kinds of uh, rabbinic, rabbinic and lay leadership. Um, we did two two-year cycles of that. We just finished uh, the second two-year cycle of it. So we had 14 fellows total who went through the program. As Elka can, I'm sure, attest, there is so much learning that comes from, uh, from, these, kind, from these kind of fellowship programs. Um, part of, it was partially built. Uh, off of or envisioned off of my experience as a as a fellow at B'nai Jeshurun in New York City years ago where I was a Marshall T. Meyer fellow and the idea was if you immerse a young rabbi in uh, in an extraordinary community the learning will be immense and it's obviously going to be different uh, different takeaways for different people in these different environments um, I think that we did a much better job uh, second time around as often as often we do because we learned so much about where the needs are, how we can support our people better, how we can support the individual communities that were do, that were um, that were really hosting these rabbinic fellowships. I still believe very strongly in this idea, and I think that one of the best uh, pieces that's come from this is not only the nurturing of these individual leaders. Um, but and having the benefit of their voice and fresh ideas in our communities for these years, but really the coming together of the seven communities, because we were trying to respond to what it has become a very competitive landscape in the Jewish space, because we're all operating from the zero sum mindset. If I get the $10,000 funding from the innovative community fund, then Mishkan in Chicago won't get it. But I love Lizzie and I love what she's doing in Chicago and she needs the money and so do I. So what if we work together and instead of applying for $10,000, we apply for you know something totally different where we can work together and cross pollinate and share resources and, and, and really share best practices. So to my mind, that's the most exciting outcome of the Jewish Emergent Network time uh, and what we've learned from the fellowship, how much working together has actually enhanced all of our individual communities so that we're not lifting up kind of rock stars. Instead, we're all trying to lift each other and lift up not just those seven, but the good work wherever the good work can be found. And any challenges to reflect on, to share with us that this community can learn from? Yes, but my time is up. <laughs> <laughs> I just gave you another minute. <laughs> yeah, there, I mean, there are, there are, there are so many challenges. Um, you know, I, I've learned, I, I'm try, I can try to think of, you know, of my top several. <laughs> um, we, we learned so much about, um, about gender. 
about, um, about leaders of color, about how to create truly inclusive and racially just fellowships and communal environments that are actually um, receptive to and welcoming and open to the different kinds of leadership that we, that we really wanna see in the next iteration uh, of, of American Jewish leadership. Um, we've learned a lot about communication. Um, each of us is in this network because we have a kind of similar DNA. Each of the seven organizations, and we're not the only seven, we just picked these seven because we're all friends with each other and we were all at similar places in our development, somewhere between seven and you know 15 years. Um, but we're all really busy because we're all doing things and we all do things a little bit differently. And there's some things that I'm really passionate about that Amichai, it's not at the top of his agenda at Lapshul in New York. And then there are things that Amichai really wants to work on that, yeah. you know, that Lizzie doesn't. So we, we've learned a lot about how to find our way to each other and really support and, and lift one another up. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon, for sharing that, really. Um, I'm going to move to the next question. Um, there was a conversation uh, earlier, I don't know if the three of you heard it, uh, between Andreas and Shai Held. Um, and there was a conversation between um, on, on engagement and education. Um, and so the question is, there's a critique uh, around some of the leading engagement spaces around follow-up. And the question remains, who should own the responsibility of follow-up and engagement of alumni of the biggest programs. And I'm gonna to turn to you, Elliot. What role do synagogues, congregations have in follow-up of the largest engagement programs in the Jewish community? Um, and, and we only have two minutes, so I'm gonna ask you to use one. You know, it's really a great, exquisite privilege to speak to people who aren't my congregants. Um, I, I think that, uh, so I think of uh, a few rounds I went through a few years ago with Birthright, that Birthright um, came to me um, and my congregants hoping to fund Birthright next. Um, and I um, said, well, how are you liaising with the institutions on the ground? So the um, graduates of these programs um, are being funneled into Jewish life and the response that I got was that it was the opinion of these institutions um, that a Jewish identity is better served by funding those programs and not the institutions on the ground. Um, and so the conversation didn't really go anywhere. Um, and so I think that um, if I think it's a collaborative model that we need, I think um, the win of these gap year, birthright, Massa, other programs, um, the follow-up um, are on the institutions on the ground. Mm -hmm. And I think that means that the funding models need to reflect that. It's my Jews who are going to be funding those programs, and those programs need to um, uh, situate those Jews and partner them, the graduates, with my communities. Not my community, but yeah. the communities that are funding them. Thank you, Elliot. We have so many other questions and so much that we want to continue to learn from the three of you, and we want to say thank you. We're, we're going to close by just asking you to share one bracha, one blessing, perhaps relating to the holidays. Um, I told you a minute, <laughs> but we're going to ask 30 seconds each, a brief bracha uh, for this kahila, for this community, and uh, we're going to say thank you to the, each of you. Um, we'll start with you, Elka. 30 seconds, please. Okay, I, I'm not gonna give a bracha because I had put on a minute. So I'm gonna use 30 seconds to ask everyone on this call to go and thank their professional staffs at their organizations, especially their synagogues. The way that rabbis have been working the last six months is unbelievable. So before you complain about glitches in the technology and you wish they had stand closer to the mic or farther away from the mic or your glasses were shut. Whatever you need to say to them, start and be grateful. Just no one will ever tell you you were too grateful. So that's my blessing for you. Amen. Start with your rabbis. Be grateful. Amen. Amen. Elliot. Can I just say amen to Elka? Or not for rabbis in a self-serving way, but I can't 
look, the only way we're going to get through this, we are all making a lot of decisions, imperfect decisions, um, uh, in a um, in a world we didn't choose. And so we have to lead with gratitude. Mm. We have to lead with generosity of spirit. We have to lead with that there's more about things that we don't know than we do know. And given the choice of um, cynicism and suspicion or, um, or, or, or gratitude and graciousness, let's choose gratitude and graciousness as we enter this new year. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Sharon, final 30 seconds. Yeah, I love that so much. Thank you, Elka, for lifting that up. And I, I just, I will just say that this period of chaos and turmoil will end at some point. We will be on the other side of this and we will be speaking about all of these crises in the past tense. We have to be different on the other side of it than we were before we went in. We can't waste all of this suffering. So much has happened. This is an inflection point, and we have to use this as a moment for an outburst of creative, courageous thinking about the kind of people we want to be, about the kind of Jewish communities we want to be in and Jewish community we want to live in, and about the kind of country and the kind of world we want to be in. We have to be different, and we have to be better on the other side of this because there's been too much pain to let it be just a wash, a loss of six months or a year or two years. It just simply can't be. So I am both looking to find the strength to survive, but also trying to think creatively about what's going to come after. Amen. Thank you, each of you. Shana Tova, we're so grateful to all of you for your time. I'm turning it to Tamar, wishing you all Shana Tova. Thank you, Manny. Thank you so much. Thank you, Manny and Sharon and Elka and Elliot for, for your beautiful words. And I want to wish you all a Shana Tova. Um, as Manny said, there's so much, many questions that we didn't get to. And we are going to have another opportunity with different, some other thought leaders in this space on October, Thursday, October 22nd, between 12 and 1 15 Eastern time to come together and learn more about spiritual communities and innovation. And Manny will again facilitate that. But um, to Thank you, Manny. And I wanted to just thank everybody that participated today, all the speakers, all the panelists. This was a wonderful way for us to have um, time together to learn and get inspired for the for the new year and to get into the high holidays in the hopefully a good state of mind and a wonderful way for us to have our first annual program together. And we look forward to learning with you all in a variety of different ways in the coming weeks and, and in this coming new year. Shana to everybody, stay healthy and well, and see you all soon.